Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing the concept of metaplasia. Now, if you haven't already done so, don't forget to subscribe to our account because your support means a lot to us and it really allows us to be able to create this content free of charge so that you can continue learning and improving your knowledge for your medical education purposes. So with that being said, let's discuss metaplasia, but first discussing the basic concept or concepts of cellular adaptations. From here, we're going to discuss the concept of metaplasia, discuss a few examples you need to understand about metaplasia, or, and then we'll wrap it up. So when we're talking about our cells, you need to remember that your cells are constantly under a lot of stress, mainly because of the environment that they are in. Our local small cellular environments can be very toxic, and one example of that toxic environment structure is the stomach lining. The stomach lining is constantly being exposed to stomach acid, and stomach acid is obviously, like the name says, very acidic because of the hydrochloric acid content. And that acidic content it constantly erodes away these, the stomach lining. But the cells in our stomach lining have adapted in a way so that they are able to handle that stress because if they did not, our acid would eat through, eat through our stomach and we would have gastric contents in our abdomen all the time and we would die through septic shock. But that doesn't happen. Now, when we're talking about organs overall, they're generally in a state of homeostasis, but they can change. Organs can change when they are put under a lot of stress. And when that happens, they are going to change based off of the type and severity of the stress. If you increase the stress in general, it's going to lead to the growth of an organ. So if you increase severity, you will definitely see increase in growth. And there are two main types of growth mechanisms or growth adaptations we have. Those are hypertrophy and hyperplasia, both of which we have discussed in previous videos. So you definitely want to check that out. Now, when an organ grows because of stress, it's going to go through these mechanisms. But what happens when you remove the stress or the stress goes away? Essentially, we have a reversal mechanism called atrophy. And atrophy is going to allow our body's organs to go back to normal state, aka it's going to allow for the homeostasis of an organ to occur, what we said right here. Atrophy is the main reversal agent for hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Now, all of this has to do with severity of the stress, but what happens when you change the type of stress? Well, when you change the type of stress our body is being put under from one type to another type, we also have a growth adaptation or a cellular adaptation that can occur, and that is called metaplasia. And in this condition, organs can also change the type of cells they have to accommodate that stress. So now let's talk about the concept of metaplasia in more detail. Metaplasia is the growth adaptation that occurs where when you change the type of stress, our cells are going to transform from one differentiated cell type to another differentiated cell type, okay? And that happens because of this change in stress of an organ that leads to changing the type of cell. This is all because of the change in the type of stress for the most part, which we will talk about in a second. That's what's happening normally, all right? I mean, that's what's happening in this condition. Normally, that you have a baseline type of stress, but if you change the type of stress, you can go through metaplastic changes. Now, usually, this will occur at the cell, at the stem cell, uh, the stem cell level via cellular reprogramming. This is very high yield, so you want to commit this to your memory. So what happens really in metaplasia is that the metaplastic cells are going to go from one cell type to another cell type. And this is going to most commonly occur in the surface epithelium. Why does that happen? It's because the surface epithelium is the most common site of environmental changes. Take, for example, your skin. You're constantly cutting your skin. You're constantly being exposed to hot liquids, basic liquids, acidic liquids, etc., etc. And you're constantly putting the surface epithelium of your cell, of your skin, under a lot of stress. The surface lining for any organ is usually the most uh, common place where your metaplastic changes are going to occur. Now, these metaplastic conditions or metaplastic changes and the metaplastic cells that result from these changes usually are better, better handled, uh, better equipped or better adapted to handle the stress that they are, that they are being placed under. The quintessential, the quintessential example of metaplasia is Barrett's esophagus, which we're going to discuss right now. But I want to make sure you understand that this is a very high yield concept. This is something you 
will be tested on at some point in your career, whether it is in a flyby question or in an academic uh, testing situation. This is a very high yield concept that you need to commit to memory and never forget. So let's talk about Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus is the metaplastic condition where the mucosal lining of our esophagus in the lower portion changes. It is a change in the mucosal lining. So let's talk about the uh, anatomy. Right here, you have your nose, you have your mouth, and your chin, you have your nasopharynx, your oropharynx, and they combine, and then you go to your esophagus, your esophagus goes down your body, and then it goes into your stomach. Okay, so this right here is your esophagus. And the Barrett's esophagus is going to occur in this location, mainly right here, okay? Why does this happen? Now, you got to remember that normally, in a normal setting, this right here, you have stratified squamous cell type. This is the normal cell uh, structure or the cell type in our esophagus. It is stratified squamous, okay? In Barrett's esophagus, the stratified squamous structure is going to convert to simple columnar epithelium. It is going to go from stratified squamous to simple columnar, okay, with goblet cells in between from here and there, okay. Now, you got to remember that this is all happening because our body is adapting to a certain type of stress. Now, this type of epithelium, the simple columnar epithelium, is present in your body, in your digestive system, but it's not present in the esophagus. It's actually present in your small and large intestines. So if it's present in small and large intestines, what is its purpose and why is it there? You got to think anatomically. You see, what is being, uh, what's happening in the small and large intestines? Essentially, your gastric contents empty into your small, small and large intestines. That's where, where they end up going. Well, your gastric contents are very acidic. And if they're very acidic, your body, your intestines have to have adopted uh, a mechanism to be able to handle that acid. And the way they do that is because of the fact that they have the goblet cells interspersed in the simple columnar uh, setup. That allows our internal uh, intestines to be able to handle the stress that they're being put under. So why would our esophagus convert from stratified squamous to simple columnar? Mainly, it has to be exposed to acid. And what condition causes the gastric acid in our stomach to reflux up into the esophagus? I gave it away. It's pretty simple. It's called GERD. Barrett's esophagus is going to occur due to constant and untreated GERD. This is very, very important to understand. When you do not treat GERD and you are exposing your esophagus to the acidic contents of your stomach constantly, you are going to have a metaplastic change because your esophagus cannot handle the acidic content in a normal state. It has to change its cell to be able to handle the amount of stress it's being put under. The columnar cells are better suited to handle that acidic environment and hence that's why they end up showing up in the esophagus. Now, why is this so important? Why are we talking about all of this? Mainly because if left untreated, Barrett's esophagus can progress to esophageal carcinoma or esophageal adenocarcinoma. That is very, very important, very, very scary, and is a very, very uh, uh, important fact you need to commit to your memory, commit to your mind, and never forget. So it's very easy talking about this, so let's look at this and let's see what it looks like. This right here is a histology slide of an esophageal sample or esophageal biopsy. And as you can see, you have this structure right here. And if you look carefully, this is all stratified squamous. This is all stratified squamous uh, uh, cell cells right here, meaning this is the normal structure okay, of the esophagus. This is how it should normally look like, all right? And you have these stratified squamous cells. But compared to this portion on the left-hand side, this is not exactly looking like it's stratified squamous at all. In fact, these look more columnar, which they are. So if you look right here, you have your simple columnar cells right here, okay? 
with these goblet cells that are being interspersed right here, right here, randomly, okay? And this right here is the abnormal structure. This is what Barrett's esophagus looks like. You will see a clear demarcation between simple squamous right here or stratified squamous with simple columnar. And demarcation seems to be running like around this area right here. Okay, so if you look carefully, you can see the different different cell types. And when you have this harsh of a change, especially in the esophagus, you can say with good confidence that you're looking at Barrett's esophagus. Commit this slide, commit this image, commit this concept to memory. Do not forget this because this is very high yield. Now, when it comes to metaplasia, one thing you need to remember is that for the most part, metaplasia is removable or is reversible if you remove the stressor. If you remove the GERD, if you treat the GERD properly and you get it under control, and Barrett's esophagus will go away. It won't progress to cancer. But if you do not treat it, if you do not get rid of that stress change that occurred, it can progress to dysplasia and even cancer. And that's why metaplasia is so dangerous because it has the potential to cause death long term. For example, Barrett's esophagus can become esophageal adenocarcinoma and esophageal adenocarcinoma can be very deadly. So one thing you need to remember now when it comes to metaplasia, you need to remember certain types of metaplasia. There are three main types of metaplasia, which I'm going to write over here. So you remember these examples and you commit them to memory. You have apocrine metaplasia, okay. you have vitamin A, you need to remember, we're going to talk about that. And then you have mesenchymal metaplasia. Okay, so let's talk about apocrine metaplasia. I know we just said that if left untreated, metaplasia can progress to dysplasia and cancer. That is something that can happen, but it doesn't happen all the time. And there is an example for that, and that is apocrine metaplasia. Apocrine metaplasia will not lead to cancer because apocrine metaplasia, remember, is a reversible transformation of the cells of an apocrine phenotype. One common thing you need to remember is that this is very commonly, uh, this is a very common occurrence in the breast, aka fibrocystic changes. Fibrocystic changes occur in many, many females. It's a very common occurrence. And if it was this dangerous, fibrocystic changes in the breast would lead to breast, you know, uh, increase in breast cancer rates. But that really doesn't happen. We don't see the relationship between the two. So this is a type of apocrine metaplasia that's not really going to lead to cancer. Very important to remember, commit this concept to memory. The other concept we talked about then is vitamin A. Vitamin A is very important because vitamin A deficiency, vitamin A deficiency, aka low vitamin A levels in your body can lead to metaplasia. Now, why is that the case? Why does vitamin A lead to metaplasia? It all goes down to the function of this vitamin. This vitamin is very necessary. It's very important for maintaining special tissues in our body like your eye conjunctiva. If you do not have vitamin A, those specialized tissues cannot function properly and hence you can get many different conditions. One metaplastic condition that can occur in the eye is the keratomalacia concept where metaplastic changes in the conjunctiva can lead to keratomalacia and can lead to a lot of issues with the eye. And you can see that right here. This is an example of keratomalacia. So you definitely need vitamin A, especially because it has to do with the epithelial lining in a lot of the cells, a lot of epithelial lining. Uh, um, uh, it, it's needed for proper function of the epithelial lining, excuse me, and it can lead to keratomalacia if left untreated. Now, the final concept is the mesenchymal tissue. Mesenchymal tissue can also lead to metaplasia if they are being put under a change in the type of stress that they're normally used to. So mesenchymal tissue is just your connective tissue, right? And the classic case of metaplasia in mesenchymal tissue is myositis ossificans, and the name really gives it away. Myositis, aka something to do with the muscle, and ossificans, ossification of something to do with the muscle. So when we're talking about myositis ossificans, you essentially are dealing with muscle that becomes bone. You see, this occurs when you have trauma to the skeletal muscle itself. And when you have trauma, you're going to have some inflammation of that muscle that occurs during the, the traumatic phase and during the healing phase. That's normal. The abnormal thing about this is that the inflammation is going to lead to metaplastic production of bone in the skeletal muscle. And you can see that right here. This ossification 
right here between the thumb and the first uh, interphalangeal joint right here, or this first uh, MCP, is essentially an ossification that should not be there. This is an ossified portion of the bone, okay? Now, the way you remember this is through two things. Number one, you have to have the history of some sort of trauma. It can be blunt force trauma, it can be very jagged or sharp trauma, but there has to be some trauma to the skeletal muscle. And then number two, you have to look at the x-ray. And when you look at the x-ray just like this, it's gonna look exactly the same as a bone. You see, it looks similar to this bony structure right here, but it's not. And the reason why you can differentiate this from the bone is mainly because of this gap right here. You see this gap right here? Well, this tells you that this is not connected to the actual bone. And why would that be important? Because if you see this extra right here, you might get this confused for bone cancer, like osteosarcoma. But because you have this gap and you know that it's not growing from the bone in the case of osteosarcoma, which it would be, you can, defend, you can differentiate this from this condition. Combine that with the clinical correlation of the recent trauma to the skeletal muscle, and you can accurately say that this is a metaplastic condition that is occurring in the mesenchymal tissue called myositis ossificans, okay? A very important concept and something you need to remember. So now we have discussed four main concepts. Number one, we talked about Barrett's... Number two, about apocrine metaplasia, aka fibrosis changes in the breast. Number three, we talked about vitamin A and vitamin A deficiency. And then number four, we talked about mesenchymal me uh, metaplasia. Okay, these concepts are very important. You need to remember this and you need to recall them during the test. And I highly recommend you understand these concepts in detail so you know what you are going to be tested on. So with that being said, that pretty much covers a majority of the things you need to know from metaplasia. I hope you found this video educational and helpful. If you did, consider subscribing to our channel because your support really means a lot to us. If you like this content and you want to see more content like this, go to our website at www.madmedicine.org where you can find more educational content for your exam prep free of charge. Thank you.